chapter. And would you poke the little light thing for me? Tenth chapter, and where did you say, Mark, the eleventh verse? That's right. And the topic under discussion, we're looking at three big questions in this work. Who am I? What is this world? And how has it come about? So to answer the question, who am I? We take on the practice of Subject object discrimination. I'm not the body. I'm not the energy. I'm not feelings. I'm not thoughts. I'm not visuals that I have in meditation. I'm not buzzings in my chakras. I'm not presences. Who am I? I am that ground of being. Pure awareness, which is birthless, changeless, and deathless. What is this world? And what Krishna has been working on is this world comes about in the same way as the dream world does for you and me individually. You are the God of your dream. So what happens in a dream? My one mind in the dream state becomes a dream body with a dream ego identified with it, with a dream world of name and form outside and a dream interior world of thoughts and feelings inside. All of that is nothing but my mind appearing as no word, no wing, and no nook, as Swamiji used to say. Now, all of this comes about in the same manner, except who's doing the dreaming. Krishna is doing the dreaming. For the infinite, it's a lucid dream. Krishna is not deluded like you and I am. So that's the idea that the world comes about like imagination. It's not created, it's imagined. And again, as the result of that, there are enormous ramifications from that. We won't go into them too much tonight. Um, the world is far more plastic and malleable than we think. All right, verse 11. Can you help us out, Deepa? Sure. Tesha meva, Tesha meva nukam partha, Mahamagyana jantamaha, Nashaya, Myatma bhavasto, Gyana deepena bhaswata. Out of the mere compassion for them, I, dwelling within their hearts, destroy the darkness born of ignorance by the luminous lamp of knowledge. So, in this world, there are several metaphysical laws and forces that take place. Swamiji always used to say it's a cosmos, not a chaos. So, in the infinite mind of God, the world has order to it. So yesterday when I got up, light traveled at 186,000 miles per second. When I got up today, traveled the same speed. 
God's laws. In this world, we have the law of cause and effect. If I turn the light switch, the lamp goes on. If you put the key in the ignition and turn it, the car starts, hopefully. Cause and effect. But there's a metaphysical understanding of cause and effect. We call that the law of karma. Karma is just action. We human beings sometimes get all caught up in good karma and bad karma. From, from the standpoint of yoga, we don't look at it that way. Karma is simply the inevitable result of past actions. The energy you put out comes back to you in kind. If you run around mouthing off to the cops, don't be surprised if they throw you in jail. If you punch someone in the face, don't be surprised if they punch you back. That part of it seems pretty obvious. If you go around in the world and you do your best to be generous and kind, and thoughtful of others, watch how that comes back to you. So the energy we put out comes back. I like to think of it as if you take a stone and you drop it into a pond, then the ripples go out to the shore. Then they come back. Cause and effect. Karma. So we set in motion chains of our uh, chains of causation by our actions, by our intentions, by our desires. Everything in this world has an effect as a cause. I'll refresh my memory. Trevor, Trevor, you're in school, right? Yeah. What do you study? Anthropology. Anthropology. Okay. So do you want to be an anthropologist? I do, yeah. Cool. So um, how many dance classes do you need to take to become an anthropologist? None. Oh. No dance classes. What about uh, piano playing? Not that either. What do you have to take to become an anthropologist? Anthropology classes. What do you know? Cause and effect. Now, many of us don't realize this in the world. Oh, Jim, what I really want to do is be an artist. But right now, what I need to do is get it job in administration until I can make enough money so I can then be an artist. Anybody had thoughts like that? Guess what happens if you get the job as the administrator and you stay with it for years? You become a very good administrator. Don't postpone your life. Cause and effect. What do you need to do to be an artist? Make art. What do you need to do to be an anthropologist? Study anthropology. The end is the means in a different form. So simple once you get it. Now, we have 
the wheel of karma. This life, I want to be a, a, an anthropologist. You know, that was satisfying to some degree, but maybe it would have been better if I'd been a sumo wrestler. Have that idea, you come back another life as a sumo wrestler. You want to be a sumo wrestler? No. Nope. You have the wrong body for it. <laughs> it was just like the wrong gender, too. <laughs> so you have to come back over with fat Japanese guy. So we come in with the equipment that we need to experience what we want to experience, fulfill the dreams and desires. But that's not the only force going on in the human psyche. In addition to karma, there's dharma. Now, the dictionary definition of dharma, oh, there's two and a half pages of it. But the, the first one is it's the essence or the nature of a thing without which it would not be the thing that it is. It also means duty. It also means the very path. It also means the way of living in the world. I mean, there are lots and lots of meanings for it. The first one, it's the essence of something, the nature of something. It's the nature of water to be wet. The Dharma water is to be wet. It's the nature of fire to burn. It's the Dharma of fire to burn. It's the nature of sugar to be sweet. It's the Dharma of sugar to be sweet. Now, Dharma can move through time and space. What's the difference between a lake and a river? One flows the ocean. Or to some lower elevation or like another lake or something, or, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it moves through time and space from a higher elevation to a lower. That's what a river does. So it involves movement as well. What is the dharma of a human being? That is an interesting question. Liberation. What answer? Exist. Huh? To exist. Exist, that's a good one. Action. Not so sure. Self-realization. Dharma of a human being is God consciousness. <coughs> Self knowledge. This is twofold. How do you know you are you? You don't see, hear, taste, touch, smell, emote, or think yourself that you know you are. And that self evidence of I is always there. What is it about you that makes you you? You know you're you. And never stop. But we can also think of the Dharma of a human being. Just like I think it was Fang who said self realization or liberation. Mm -hmm. This movement from our current state of ignorance to that God consciousness within the mind, I know I am that darkness. Shivoham, Shivoham, I am Shiva. So, how does that Dharma express itself? So, this is the point Krishna is getting at here in this verse. 
there's some impulse within us. The Christian term we use in theology is there's a salvific impulse in each one of us that yearns for the divine. But it's much funkier and nitty gritty than that. The human mind is a pleasure seeker, pain avoider mechanism. From the moment you get up to the moment your head hits the pillow at night, you're really only engaged in one activity, and that's to seek the good by your understanding of the good and to avoid suffering. Nobody says, Oh, it's three o'clock, I think I'll go. Uh, turn on the, the stove and put my hand over the burner. Nobody does that. <laughs> we don't seek suffering. We may seek something that's uncomfortable for our good. Have you stayed up all night studying for a test yet? Yeah, several times. Yeah. <laughs> Sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. It's not fun. But you want the good grade on the exam. Mm. So we can sublimate lower desires for a higher desire. If you've ever been a mother, believe me, most mothers have moments when they want to take the damn baby and throw it through the window. It won't stop crying. Powerless and helpless. Colicky baby. But you suit up and show up and care for the baby anyway. That's love. So, the only real question that we have okay, where's the good? Is it drug, sex, and rock and roll? You may have tried that. Finding the right partner. <sighs> Most couples that have been married for a long, long time when asked, have you thought of divorce? No. Murder? Yes. <laughs> Not divorce. <laughs> Where is the good? Where is the good? We try this, and then we try that, and we try another thing. Maybe it's money, maybe it's a fancy car. True story, true story. I have a friend who's a nurse, and he was raised really impoverished. His parents were addicts, and he ended up having to basically raise himself. He left home at 14. And he's always had this thing of, you know, wanting stuff to make up for the, the, the poverty of his childhood. So he has a big fancy SUV and stuff like that. But something happened to him today. He was in, I think it was Starbucks or something like that. He was buying his coffee. And the cashier says, where do you work? It's kind of a weird question to ask a customer. And he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a nurse at Kaiser. So she says, did you used to work at St. Mary's? He said, yes. And she says, you probably don't remember, but four years ago, my husband was in the ICU and dying. You were so incredible to me and to him. I've never met anybody with a heart like yours. They told me the story. I was in tears. And she was so grateful to him. Her husband died. And she had to pull the plug, which was 
we would have a Hebrews there with came here and he was telling me the story and he says, weep and weep and weep and he says, Jim, that's who I really am. That's who I really am. You know, and she was like a viewer to show him this incredible vulnerability of soul. And I said, well, how did that feel compared to getting a fancy car? That was nothing compared to this experience. <laughs> Getting a tune to his, what we would call Spinarma, his purpose in life. It's a new purpose. It's deeply spiritual purpose. But you see, we have this evolution of experiences and desires. Why was he able to be with that woman in that way? Because he has God in his life. He has God in his life. It's an amazing, amazing story here this morning. A real God shot, I call it. And eventually, eventually, we want to come home. All the way. And this is the inner guru. This is the inner Christ. This is God within us. As this divine in. So it's not just karma. It's not just a rat race. There's this other impulse in the human heart moving us towards the infinite. And it literally expresses it in our minds as my desire for the good and my attempt to avoid my suffering. Do you know a human being who doesn't seek the good? As they understand it. Even someone who's violent. Why are they beating somebody else or robbing them? Because they think it'll get rid of the pain. I was talking with a person earlier in the week who was really, really upset. And when they were a teenager, they used to cut themselves. They had a terrible fight, family. And cut themselves. Why would a person hurt themselves? Because the pain was so bad, that was a way to distract from the pain. That's the only reason people do horrible things. Sometimes we harm ourselves, frequently harm others. But we're still seeking the good. We're still seeking Krishna. All. Then in our evolution, our unfoldment, that light bulb goes on and we start doing it consciously. We figure, okay, now I'm a god chunky. I know that's what I do. Any thoughts on this? Are the, um, are the good qualities in people like that, like um, altruism that the nurse exemplified like are those part of are those like god shining through like a you got it yes yes so so god is like the source of all that's good in the world absolutely and all that's bad where else can it come from 
but it's part of a process. In Christianity, which claims to be monotheistic, it actually isn't for a lot of Christians. There's a good deity, God, Yahweh, Jehovah, the author of all good, and there's the devil, who's a lesser God, who has access to humanity. Don't be tempted by the devil, you'll be cast into eternal hell. None of this, by the way, is in scripture. People made it up, even though it's dogma in a lot of Christian churches. It's not in the scriptures. It isn't. Read the Bible and you tell me if you can find it. But in Sufism, there's a lot. Then there's a character called Iblis. Iblis is kind of an equivalent to the Christian Satan. And the mythology is God told Iblis to go worship humanity. And Iblis says, no way. I'm only going to worship you. God says, you disobeyed me. So your penance is you must roam among people and vex them. Bring them trouble. What is vex? Vex means to... to to uh, bother, to upset, to trouble people. And because of that, you will cause them to turn to me. The classic example of that is somebody who goes down the path of, let's say, drug addiction. And then their life is just totally desperate. Crash and burn. And they go into rehab. And they start to put their lives back together on a spiritual basis. So was the episode of drug addiction bad or good? Certainly painful. But in the end, it turned that person's mind to God. You see the difference? It's all part, part of the plan. We have enough freedom, as it were, to screw things up. But when we go down those paths, we are not punished for our sins. We are punished by our sins. You go out Friday night and get super drunk. You wake up Saturday morning with a hangover. God isn't punishing you. Why are you hung over? Karma, the inevitable results of your actions. But if it hurts bad enough, you may not do it again. So this is a very subtle verse. So, Deepa, will you read the English again with all our discussion in mind? Sure. Let me bring up the page just a sec. Out of mere compassion for them, I, dwelling within their hearts, destroy the darkness born of ignorance by the luminous lamp of knowledge. Yes. So this God consciousness within each of us is compassion and mercy 
and forgiveness. And it destroys the darkness and brings us whole. Now, the compassion of God is not capricious. God doesn't look at Trevor and say, I like the way you're doing your hair today, compassion. And to thank, eh, you're just kind of a slob today. Whack! There's no such God. No such God. The love of God, the compassion of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God is a constant, it's God's nature, that we can shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the Spirit, how the thickness of egoism. All right, next verse, number 12. So it's two verses together. Okay, 12 and 13 then. Okay. Arjunavacha Param Brahma Param Dhamma Pavitram Paramam Bhavan Purusham Shashvatam Divya Madi Deva Majam Vibhum Ahustvam Rushaya Sarve Devar Shirnara Dar Devar Shirnara Dastatha Asito Devalo Vyasa Swayam Chaiva Bravishime Arjuna said, You are the Supreme Brahman, the Supreme Abode, the Supreme Purifier, Eternal Divine Purusha, the God of all gods, unborn and omnipresent. All the rishis have thus declared you, as also the Devarishi Narada, so also Asita, Devala, and Vyasa. And now the same you yourself say to me. So here, Arjuna is recognizing the divine nature of Krishna. And he confesses, we have that term in Christianity, that one confesses that Jesus is Lord, etc. Here, Arjuna has his confession of the divine nature of Krishna. And let's go through each one of these words. Now, understand, Krishna isn't out there. Krishna is not the blue boy, the cow herd. There's no Krishna in the sky. Krishna is you. So what Arjuna is saying now about Krishna is true about the self in you. Now, we have to be very careful here. When we talk about the self, we don't want to externalize. Well, what do you think about the self? Well, this is what I think about the self. What do you think about the self? Mm -hmm. As if it's like something out there that does nothing to free us. We have to start with our experience. Who sees the phone? I do. That's yourself. Now, my doubt, my confusion, my ignorance is I haven't really investigated that direct experience. So in a meditation verse, make our minds very still. Letting go of the world, letting go of all our problems. Endeavoring to have what I call a radical reversal of the attentive faculty. See if you can infer 
notice. Who am I? What's my nature? So all these things that Arjun is going to say about Krishna, see whether or not they are true about the self in you. So the first idea, Deepa. You are the Supreme Brahman. Yes. Is that just another God name? Well, yes and no. Comes from the root bird, which means really, really big. And in the Vedas, in the Upanishads, we have a definition. The Jnanam Brahma. Brahman is consciousness. Brahman is knowing. I am Atma Brahma. This self is. Here, Krishna, that may be my Ishta Devata, the God that I worship. And what it is, is the ground of being of the whole universe. Is the same as the self. Next idea. You are uh, the supreme abode. Ah, uh, the supreme abode. Abode here is like a home, a place. So if you want to feel safe, or oh, I want to get back to my home. Makes me feel safe. I'm going to go back to my parents' home. It's where I feel safe. Or if you're in a war torn country, oh, I don't want to be around all this conflict. I want to go home where it's safe. Here, the scripture is saying the place where you are safe. The place where God lives is yourself. It is the home, it is the abode, it is the shelter. Bring your mind. Next idea. Uh, the Supreme Purifier. Ah, yes. So, you know, many of us feel that, oh, I'm such a vulgar person. You know, I'm angry and I'm resentful and I'm fearful and I'm greedy. I wish I went this way. I would love to be pure. Mother Teresa or somebody like that. Swamiji, pure. What the scripture is saying is the purity you yearn for, in fact, you already. One of the descriptions of the self that points near Malam without any dirt, without any taint. Vishuddham, extremely pure. When I, as it were, look behind my eyes and notice the noticer. There's no thing there. It's vast. Empty like the sky. Now, there's something very paradoxical here. 
the way to heal the mind is to get out of the mind. When your identity shifts from the ego to this witnessing consciousness, and you let go of all the machinations of trying to control the mind, the mind starts to settle down and in fact starts to become pure. So when you have pure water, it doesn't mean it's good water as opposed to bad water. It means it doesn't have other stuff in it. You have a Brita filler filter or a no or what is it, zero filter. Brita filter only gets some of the stuff out. Zero filter gets it all. How do we purify the mind? Let go of my attachment to the world of name and form. Let go of my identification with ideas of self. Stay identified as that pure witnessing consciousness. So it is the supreme purifier. It's already pure. And it's this that purifies the human heart. Next idea. Eternal. Yes. There are two words which in English we don't get the nuance. There are words like sanatanam, purano which mean very old or ancient. Nitya means eternal, outside of time. Yourself is both. But here, the question is, when have you ever not been you? You have no experience of, oh, I wasn't, now I am. You may think you had no existence before your birth, but you have as no memory. Hear the scripture thunders. You are earthless, changeless, death. Bhagavad Gita Chopra says, says the opposite of death is not life. The opposite of death is birth. There is no opposite to life. Because you are Nitya. Next idea. Divine Purusha. Ah, lots of stuff in this one. The word Purusha is very, very old. We have the Purusha Sukkham, the hymn to the divine person in the Rig Veda. In the Sankhya philosophy, which is the language that Gita uses, we have this dualism. We have matter, Prakriti, and we have spirit, Purusha. Sometimes Purusha is seen as an entity, 
kind of like the individual soul, sometimes seen as God, as a person. But within this context, it is the ancient Well, let's approach it this way. What is it that makes you a person? Is it your arms, your legs, your nose, your toes? Your soul? What's a soul? That's a, just a word somebody told you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like awareness, maybe? Is it? Or no, maybe it, it is awareness, not your soul. I think it was that. Yeah. Who sees the phone? Beauty, right? What is it that makes you exist? Conscious? You have to be here. You're not an it, you're a who. It's a later chapter, Purushottama Yoga. Uttama Purusha, the ultimate essence of personness. That's you. And it's so here, it's so present, it's so you. But because it is always here, we miss it. The self is difficult to realize, not because it's far away or transcendental, where you need to take ayahuasca. Self is difficult to realize because of its profound ordinariness. It's you. Doubt is where's the nature of me? In a very quiet mind. Check it out. Next idea. Sorry, I'm reading from my phone. Uh, the God of all gods. Yes. So we have what we call sometimes demigods, the various devas. Those are kind of like department heads. In Judaism, we have all these levels of beings. You have angels, you have Archangels. I don't know what the Hebrew is. They're translated like thrones and dominions. Have you heard those words, Natalie? Malachim or Malach. But these are our uh, spiritual beings on other realms. But who's the head honcho? Another way to look at all these, these are dimensions of the psyche. But who is it who illumines everything, the self in all? That's Krishna. It's your I as the I. Next one. The unborn. Yes, ajata, uh, you are not born. Body is born, but you are not the body. Very important to understand. Are you in the body? Do you incarnate into the body? Or is the body in you? And the question I ask is, do you incarnate into a dream? Talked about this in chapter nine. 
when I dream, I have a dream body. It sure feels like I'm in that body. On awakening, no, I am not in the body. The body is in me. So also the dream of this embodiment is just that. But you are not born. Next idea. Omnipresent. Yes. So this self is everywhere. All the things and beings in the entire universe exist in it. And that consciousness pervades everything. Clearest example that we have is it's like space. So I have room space and I have glass space. The glass inside the space separated from the room space. Now watch my magic trick. Did I move space? The glass is in space. The space pervades everything. Consciousness is even more subtle than space. Again, this becomes easy to understand. If you dream about a rock, your mind pervades the rock of your dream. Next idea. Those are all the ideas. And then after that, there's a little bit of a... Okay, what's next? All the rishis have thus declared you as also the Deva Rishi Narada, so also Asita, Devala, and Vyasa. And now the Stop. same... Go ahead. Sorry. Go and now it. the same you... And now the same you yourself say to me. So these are just a list of some of the great saints. Rishis are the men of old who wrote the Vedas, the scriptures. We're studying the Nara, the Bhakti Sutra, one of the great Rishis. But the point here is, what is the self in all of these great Mahatmas? Now, I have news for you. The term we use in Sanskrit for a divine incarnation of God is an avatar. We say, oh, Krishna is an avatar. He's a divine incarnation of God. Rama is an avatar. Divine incarnation of God. The Tatriya, oh, he's a divine incarnation of Lord Shiva. I have news for you. You are a divine incarnation of God. What's the difference between you as an individual and Lord Krishna or Narada or any of the other rishis? It's like what's the difference between your thumb and your forefinger? Different purposes. Just as you as an ego pervade your body. I am the self of my thumb. I'm the self of my nose. But the thumb can't say, I'm going to try to smell. The thumb can only do the thumb thing. The nose can't grab things. It can't be the hand. Okay. 
in the Christian tradition, we have this idea the church is the body of Christ. Every individual fulfills the function of the body of Christ. But the same thing is true in all religions. You are a divine incarnation of God. The only difference is what we call the upadis, the equipment, your body, mind, intellect. And what is God's plan for you? But that's not change. The self in you. Any thoughts on this? All right, next verse. Just a sec. Sarvameta dritam manye yan mam vadasi keshava nahite bhagavan vyaktim vidur devana danavaha. I believe all this that you say to me as true, O Keshava. Verily, O blessed Lord, neither the devas nor the danavas know your manifestation or identity. So, what he's saying here is nobody knows your identity, but I believe it. And the implication here is, what is it that knows the self? My, hang on just a minute. Are you both leaving? Uh, I, I can come with That's fine. Mm -hmm. I understand. It's just uh, you, you, disturbing. Just, I will wait for you sorry. to go. You should, All right. Because he's downstairs. He could drive you to the train so you don't have to walk. He's downstairs. He could drive you to the train. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, sorry. Then that's us 30 minutes. Okay. He'll drive you one of the. Okay. We'll be done in another couple of minutes. Sorry. Sorry. But we'll end here. Sorry, Shane. Yes. The train's only come every 30 minutes.